Let's pray one more time before we dig into God's Word together. Heavenly Father, we're about to spend some time uh, focusing and exploring your Word together, especially as it applies to indifference and apathy. And so I pray that you'd speak loudly and clearly through your Word as you've promised to do. pray that you'd convict us and change us, and draw us closer to you, and that we'd leave here with a a greater sense of urgency and alignment with you, that our hearts would be more transformed by you, that we'd be, uh, have our eyes open and our hearts changed to love a bit more like you do. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how you start your week or your work week or how you start each day. This is how I start most of my work days is I uh, scurry out of the house. Actually, I bring our kids down for school. I get them each to their classrooms, and then I go into my office. I fire up my computer, and I read the news. Often that's what I do. I read BBC and CBC and whatever comes up on my MSN homepage. And so I wanted to share this morning some of the headlines that caught my attention this week, and maybe you saw these as well. Uh, Here's one that stood out. The tragic lives of India's mistreated captive elephants. Next one was this. Thousands flee near Myanmar, China border. 4,000 driven from their homes since early April. I'm sure you all heard this. Eight women, two men killed in Toronto van attack. Uh, The driver part of this uncell group uh, just generally hated people who were happy. Uh, The Yemen war, the world's worst humanitarian crisis, one-third of the population is starving. Whale washes up on the beach with 64 pounds of plastic and waste in its stomach. I come to work and I read the news and I read through the headlines and then what most often happens next is I close the window uh, on my computer and I go about the rest of my day. Most often I read those things and then I don't give them a second thought again for the rest of the day unless there's something that pops up and I think, oh, I should tell Miranda about that, that an interesting fact or an interesting thing that popped up. I would like to tell you, though, that I read those things and am broken by them, heartbroken for the people of Yemen. A third of the population of a country is starving and I read that headline, maybe I read the full article, and then I go on with life as usual, just business as usual. And I know that I'm not alone in that. I know that many of us are aware of the world, aware of things that are happening, aware of crises or urgent events happening in our world, and yet we read it and then we just kind of dismiss it and keep on going through our day. I'd love to tell you that I read those things and I just spend an hour praying for them, or that as soon as I read the link, I click on Canadian Lutheran World Relief and donate money. I'd love to tell you that there was some drastic response and a call to action that I felt just immediately, but the reality is there isn't. North America right now is at this interesting place of uh, incredible blessing, incredible wealth, and also incredible apathy and indifference in lots of different situations. That's not new to the world. It's not new or unique for us. I want to share a story with you. Uh, This is a story uh, from Jesus' word, from Luke 10. It'll be up on the screen for you about a man who came uh, to Jesus, and it addresses the question of indifference. It says this, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? It's interesting, this man, this teacher comes to Jesus, is testing him, and he wants to know, uh, what do I have to do to get into heaven? What's, uh, you could read into that perhaps, what's the bare minimum, right? Like, what, what's the 51? What's the passing grade so I can get into heaven? And so Jesus says, well, well, what do you think? He says, well, I think I've got to love the Lord your God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I've got to love my neighbor as myself. Jesus says, absolutely, go do that. You'll absolutely get into heaven. And he says, but hold on, I just, just for clarity's sake, who exactly do I need to love? Who exactly is my neighbor? Like, are we talking about the guy down the street, or how many houses down are we talking about? We're certainly not talking about Samaritans. We're certainly not talking about the Greeks, are we? I mean, who exactly? What can I get away with? What's the minimum? What's the passing grade? What's the entry point so that I can get into heaven? So Jesus responds with the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know this parable. Jesus says this man is going from 
from Jericho to Jerusalem. On his way, he encounters some uh, robbers. They beat him, they steal uh, what he has, and they leave him for dead in the street. Along comes a priest, and this priest sees him, crosses over the street, uh, across the other side of the street, and keeps going on his way, just ignores him. Along comes a Levite, a person employed uh, to work in the temple. He sees the man, again, crosses the street to avoid him, keeps going on his way and totally ignores him. And then along comes this half-life, this half-breed, this Samaritan. The Samaritan sees this man in need, immediately goes to him, does what he can to help him, lifts him up onto his donkey, brings him to an inn, pays the innkeeper not only for the man to stay there, but also for any kind of uh, medical care or whatever he needs. And he says, if there's any other expenses, let me know, I'll come back and I'll repay you in full. And he asks the man, well, which one is his neighbor? The man says, well, the Samaritan. So Jesus says, go and do likewise. Jesus calls us to this incredible degree of compassion and love. Who's my neighbor? I think the answer Jesus gives is anyone I put in your road. Anyone that you come across who's in need, anyone you come across who uh, needs encouragement or support or love or grace or forgiveness, that's your neighbor. And they're not there by accident. God has put them there. God has placed them there and gives you the opportunity to love them. How do I get into heaven? Love the people I present to you. Who's my neighbor? How far down? Well, whoever I introduce to you, whoever I bring along your path, and some of them will need nothing from you at all, right? You'll you'll just kind of pass by, but some of them will actually need your love, your support, your encouragement, your care. Jesus absolutely models that for us. I think we'd all say, well, I've totally blown that. I've fallen short. I saw someone need, I actually crossed the road to get away from them, or I saw someone need asking for change. I rolled up my window or whatever it might be. I think we all know that we've fallen short, but Jesus actually truly embodies and models what it means to be the Good Samaritan. Jesus is the one who leaves his comfort, his uh, wealth, riches behind, and comes to us to pursue us. It doesn't just happen by chance to come across some people who need rescuing, but actually seeks us out. He says, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's us. That's his people. That's uh, all the world. He comes for us. Jesus is the Good Samaritan and tells us to go and do likewise. So if Jesus is the model and we're meant to kind of embody and follow his example, how do we reach a point of apathy and indifference in North America, in the world, in the church, in the Lutheran church, in this specific congregation? How do we get from that example Jesus sets to a point or place of apathy and indifference I was watching a pastor this week uh, from Life Church. His name is Craig Groschel, and he suggests three reasons on how people become indifferent. The first one is this. He says, the volume of information is overwhelming. We're just exposed to so much information. It just honestly overwhelms us. There's just constantly this barrage of, of need and hurt and, and headlines and all those other things, and it just overwhelms us. We just don't, don't even know how to process them all, how to address them all. The scope is so big and difficult, if not impossible, to care about every single headline you see. So we read it and we move on. The first one is just the volume, the enormity of information. He says the second option is perhaps this, that we feel helpless to make a change. Absolutely, I care about the people in Yemen, but now what? I mean, how do I help those people half the world away? How do I help those people uh, a third of the population? How can, I, how can I help that with the little amount of resources that I have? How can I help with the little amount of time I have? I'm so busy already with my family and with my job and with errands and groceries and shopping and laundry and everything else I'm doing. I don't even know where to begin to start helping these people who are in need. We feel helpless to make a change. And the third reason he gave is this. We are blessed and cursed with comfort. We are just so blessed with all the things around us. I mean, we're just overwhelmed with how much we have. And I think often we lose sight of that, but our fridges are overflowing. We have freezers or backup freezers to keep track of all the food that we have. We've got you know, a couch in this room and a couch in the right room. We have multiple beds and a guest room, and we also have a flex space or a den. We've got all this abundance and wealth. I heard a story. I haven't confirmed this yet, but I heard someone in this room was on their phones during worship a couple weeks ago, ordering things from Amazon. And that evening when they got home, their Amazon product arrived. 
Think about the blessing and comfort we have, that we can order something, and then that same day, it's delivered to us. It's just this incredible comfort, this wealth, this abundance that we live in, and we have to rent storage bins because we've got so much stuff, and we keep buying more because we get tired of the old stuff that we have. We're blessed and cursed with the incredible comfort that we have. So how do we break that cycle of indifference and apathy? I'm going to suggest two ways for you that I think go hand in hand. I think the first one is this. We need to spend more time with Jesus. Spend more time reading through the Gospels and processing, not just reading it to get to the end, right? Oh yeah, okay, pastor, I read Luke again this year. Well, that's great. But since we already know it, let's spend some time just reflecting and meditating and considering what motivated Jesus and how did he respond to these people? And, and when people came to him, how did he answer it? And how can I shape my life to look more like his? The more time we would spend with Jesus, the more we'd be transformed to look like them. Just like when someone gets married, as they spend time with their spouse, they start to speak the way and act the way and like the similar things that they like. All those things start to merge together. If we were to spend more time with Jesus, I think we'd merge and become more like him if we were focused on him. We'd also start to know the things that he doesn't like. Not only the things that drove Jesus and that he loved, but also the things that greatly troubled him, that he did not like, that he did not enjoy, that he resisted or that he spoke out against. We'd start to see and recognize the sin in our lives more clearly. The, the idolatry of comfort or of TV or of food or of wealth or popularity or whatever it is. We start to see those things more clearly in ourselves too. If we spent more time with Jesus, we start to be able to shift our lives to look more like his. Last week I talked about Martin Luther and the, in his mind the greatest sin was to teach someone else to doubt their faith, to teach someone else to doubt their salvation, and that they should always just know that God has promised it to them and that it's theirs in Christ. I don't know what sin Jesus would say is the absolute worst, but he points to one that seems to just um, be irreconcilable in his mind, just uh, unfitting for a Christian. I'll read it, uh, this passage for you. It's from Revelation. And in Revelation, John has this vision of heaven. And in it, uh, at the beginning, Jesus reveals to him uh, the, this message for each of these seven different churches. And as he speaks to these churches, he follows a pattern. He introduces himself. He gives an image of who he is as Christ. And then he commends the church for something. Uh, for example, you're holding to the faith, and I commend you for that. Or... Um, you've been faithful in keeping to the word. I commend you in that. He commends for something, but then he also convicts them of something. On the other hand, I see that you're doing this. So I see that you're clinging to the faith, but you, it's not your first love anymore. You've forgotten your first love. Or I see that you're uh, persevering, but some of you are also starting to adopt false religions, false gods. He commends them, and then he also convicts them of something. He does that church after church after church, letter after letter after letter. Six churches in a row he does that. But when he gets to the seventh church, he finds nothing to commend them for. Instead, he speaks these words to that church. I know your works. You aren't hot or cold. You're lukewarm. And so I spit you out of my mouth. Listen to the problem that they have. You say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. We've got everything we need, Jesus. We are totally fine. And Jesus says, this is awful. You totally missed the mark. You don't have anything. You're poor, wretched, naked, blind. You just are totally delusional in the places where you're finding your great security and your comfort. I feel like this is a pretty clear problem in our society is we have such great wealth. Every week, for sure, may, almost on a daily basis, I hear people talk about their wealth, often involving their real estate, right? Can you believe our house, the value of our house has gone up so much in the last three years or five years? And, and it's okay to talk about that, but there's a sense of security in that, right? I mean, well, we could always sell the house, we could uh, move to the boonies like Quenell, right? And then we'd be fine, all, all the bills would be paid. There's a sense of security and comfort in our riches, in our wealth, in our investments, in our RSPs. Uh, in, in our vacation property or whatever it is. And I think Jesus would look and say, man, you've, you've missed the mark. That's nothing. Just a few weeks ago, I watched as an excavator rolled up across the street and smashed a house down, right? Just a swing of its arm and that's it. The place is gone. That's how quickly we could lose all those things that we trust in. 
lose our house or our car or our health or our relationships or our RSPs or whatever else it is. All those things that we trust in, Jesus says, man, that's nothing. That's no security or comfort at all. I think that we'd become more like Jesus if we spent more time with him. We start to lose our apathy and indifference in that. The second thing I think we could do is this. We could pick one thing that breaks God's heart and immerse ourselves in it. If we would just pick one thing, we look and we say, this is overwhelming. There's too many things. I don't have nearly enough time or resources or anything else. But if we would just pick one thing, God, this breaks my heart when I think about this. I just, I read that headline and it just jumps out at me that someone's got to do something. Pick that thing. Pick it for a week or a month or a year. Invest yourself in that day after day and see if that involvement doesn't change your apathy. If suddenly you start to care more and more and more. I know that lots of you have things that you're already involved in. What would it it look like to immerse yourself even more? I know some of you care greatly about uh, protecting the lives of the unborn. What if you just invested uh, a bit more there? I, that's absolutely something that breaks God's heart. Or I know some of you are invested in missions like Ukraine or Nicaragua. I mean, what if you just invested a bit more there to understand their challenges and their burdens more? What if you invested in Yemen? A third of the population is starving. They have nothing to eat at all. What if some of us just invested right there and said, this is going to be the place, because I know it breaks God's heart, this is going to be the place where I pour my heart into. And God often talks about uh, the widows and the orphans. I mean, what if we found a way to partner with those groups? Or maybe you have a compassion child. What would it look like to have 10 compassion children? If we immersed ourselves in that, and not just to send the money, but also to read the letters and write the letters and, and see what else you could do for that community or that place. If we want to get rid of the apathy in our lives, I think we can spend more time with Jesus so that we look more like him and then invest in something that breaks his heart and see what that does to us. You know, sometimes people will go and they will have a broken heart for something. They'll go on a mission trip and they'll just weep when they come back and see, you know, Superstore where the shelves are just stocked with food and they'll just think, man, there's people starving in the world. We have all this food and and the dumpster behind the stores are just overflowing because that's expired or it's too bruised or whatever it is. But a week later or a month later or a year later, that brokenness is gone because they're not immersed in it again and again and again and again. Let me ask you this. How many of you took French in school? Okay, lots of you. How's your French today? Any... (laughs) Anybody want to hop up here and read a few verses of the Bible for us? Just translate on the fly? Pro- probably not, right? Why not? I mean, you spent years studying French. I think I studied French from grade 5 through grade 12. I think I actually did okay in it. But uh, now all I can do is put on a pretty junky accent, right? I, I couldn't go somewhere and get by, really. I mean, all that's gone. Why? Because I'm not immersed in it day after day after day. And so if we don't immerse ourselves in something, if we don't immerse ourselves in Scripture, if we don't immerse ourselves in something that breaks God's heart, then we become more and more distant from it. and become, uh, It just becomes less and less of an impact in our lives until, until it can really become nothing. How's your French? Oh, man. I used to know it pretty well. Now I can't say a word. I can say hello. The more we were immersed in it on a daily basis, the more it would radically transform our lives. I would guarantee that. Someone who picked one thing in their life was the Apostle Paul, and you know his story, I think. So the Apostle Paul wasn't a Christian at all. In fact, he was out there persecuting Christians. He was trying to wipe them off the face of the earth. He was happy to see them arrested, beaten, or killed. Um, but then he has this encounter with Jesus, and it radically transforms his life. And so he becomes this incredible missionary going out to tell other people about Jesus. And he is willing to sacrifice anything for it. So his, his career, his influence, his reputation, all those things, he's willing to be beaten and persecuted, arrested and shipwrecked, uh, all those different things for Jesus. He picks that thing, that is proclaiming the gospel as his one thing that he's going to invest in. And even perhaps more focused than that, he, his priority is to bring the gospel to the Jews, to his own people. And so when he goes to a town, he'll start there. He'll go to the temple first. Uh, he'll look for uh, groups of Jewish men praying first because that's his primary audience. That's who he has the most passion and zeal uh, to reach out to first. And then, of course, he'll go out and tell whoever else will listen. But he starts 
there. I want to share a passage with you as he talks about that from Romans 9. He says this about it. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I mean, just stop there for a second. Which of those headlines causes you great sorrow or unceasing anguish? I shared at the beginning, it, it, for me, it lasts about five seconds till I scroll to the next thing. What's that one thing that just breaks your heart again and again and again? If you don't have that one thing yet, it's because you haven't invested in it. But the more you know, the deeper you get, I think the more broken we would be. He goes on to say this, For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. I don't know if you catch what he says there. He says, these are the people. And he says, it caused me such great sorrow, such great anguish and heartbreak that I would, he says, I would gladly take their place being cut off from Christ. I'd gladly take their place and go straight to hell if that would mean some of these people would learn and believe and trust in Jesus as their Savior. That's what he says. I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, the Jews. What breaks your heart where you think, man, I would do anything for that? If I could just... I'm going to save one child, or if I could just feed one family, or if I could just uh, protect one orphan or one widow. What's that thing that would motivate you and drive you and break your heart because it breaks the heart of God? Church, what's that thing that fires you up? What would get you up out of your seats? Uh, What would get you knocking on doors or having awkward conversations because you believe in it so passionately that you need to share it. I think that there is a great apathy. I think there is a great sense of indifference. I think that all those reasons that I shared before are certainly true uh, because of the, just the abundance of information and because we feel overwhelmed and because we're just blessed and cursed with comfort. But I don't think it has to stay that way. I don't think it has to remain that way. I was driving this week on my way to visit uh, one of our shut-ins and um, saw a, someone who's not apathetic. I took a couple pictures of this guy's van. Jesus is Lord. Gospel tent rally. Jesus loves you. You could get these decals for your car. Let's go to the next one. Jesus is coming soon. Great big signs. This is just one way you could shake your apathy. Drive that every day. Let's look at the, one more picture. Turn or burn. Jesus saves. Repent. I don't know if this is the best way or not. It's a way, at least, though. And he's picked something that he's passionate about, right? And so, or or she, the gospel tent rallies, turn or burn, Jesus saves, Jesus is Lord, repent. He's picked something and he's marked by it, right? I mean, if you saw this van pull up, you'd be so curious to see who hops out, right? I mean, wouldn't you just stop and and watch and maybe you'd want to hear a conversation. You maybe wouldn't want to be in the conversation, but you'd want to overhear what this guy has to say. He's picked something and he's passionate about it. I would encourage you to spend some extra time with Jesus, learning about who he is, the character that he carries, the the things that shape him, that frustrate him, that anger him, that, that cause him to weep, the things that break his heart, and then to start to model your life after that. We will never be Jesus. We'll never be the good Samaritan, but we could make a difference, and certainly in one place, in one area, for one life, for one person. We've been blessed with the ability to do that. I want to give you a minute right now with the people you came with today, maybe a friend, maybe someone you're just sitting close beside. I just want to give you a minute just to start that conversation. If we picked one thing together, what would that thing be? What has God put on my heart that, that I'm aware of, but I just haven't invested in yet? Let's take a minute and just have that conversation with somebody close to you right now. I want to thank you for starting that conversation. Don't let it stop there. I'd encourage you over lunch, just keep thinking about that. What could be the one thing to pray about that with your friends or family? What could be that one thing where I could invest, where I could really make a difference, something that breaks God's heart and breaks mine too? The good news is wrapped up in Jesus, that Jesus was absolutely anything but apathetic or indifferent. 
we think about the story of Jesus, he has always existed, he's always been God, and he always existed in a greater comfort and wealth than we could ever even begin to imagine. Not, not just a, a property on the beach, but all of heaven and all of creation belongs to him. It all exists because of his command. And he leaves that incredible comfort to come to us because he sees something that breaks his heart. People separated from him. People dying apart from him. People drowning and dead in their sins. And so moved by that, Jesus comes to us because of his incredible love for us. And he makes time for everybody. For, he eats with anybody, talks with anybody, visits with anybody, heals essentially anybody. He, he does that because of this overwhelming principle that he has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Something precious and dear to him. And so he comes to pursue us. And he doesn't stop at any point. The Good Samaritan is this story about someone who goes out of the way, but Jesus is the real deal. God who came out of his way to us. Paul talks about that he would, he would even consider being separated from Christ, being cut off so that other people could be saved. Well, Jesus actually does that as he gets cut off, as he leaves heaven, as he goes to the cross and dies to pay the penalty for other people to be saved, for you and I to have our sins forgiven and life given to us. He's the actual good Samaritan, the Savior of the world who lives and dies to set us free. I want to talk about one more person before we wrap up, and it's just an interesting transition to watch as we think about how the resurrection changes things or how that holy weekend changes things. It's the person Nicodemus. If you remember Nicodemus, he was this influential leader, uh, a Pharisee, and he um, was interested in Jesus, and curious, not entirely indifferent, but certainly not invested in him. And so he comes to Jesus uh, one day during the night. Doesn't want anyone to see, doesn't want anyone to know, doesn't want to uh, injure his reputation at all. So he comes to Jesus at night and has this conversation where Jesus tells him he has to be born again. He leaves that. We don't hear about him again for chapters. That was in John 3. Then in John 7, we haven't heard anything about him, but at this point, the religious leaders are trying to arrest Jesus and have him killed. And Nicodemus, I think, has moved from curiosity to some sort of compassion or, or engagement with Jesus. And so as they're trying to condemn him, Nicodemus says, Doesn't, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? He's trying to defend him without risking anything. But he gets shut down right away. They, they tell him, well, are you one of the Galileans too? Are you one of his followers too? They kind of mock him, and so he steps back and doesn't say anything else. But then at the cross is where we see Nicodemus have a change. I want to read this for you. It's up on the screen. It says, with Pilate's permission, he came, Joseph, and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. I think at this point, Nicodemus has left his indecision. I think he's left his doubt and his fear and is invested in Jesus. I think at this point on the cross, Jesus, Nicodemus is okay to be associated with Jesus, that he believes that he truly is who he said he is. We don't get some big proclamation from Nicodemus. Instead, what we get is a whole lot of action that he shows up in front of everybody else, that he takes the, the dead body of Jesus off the cross. He feels its weight on his shoulder. He has the blood of Jesus stained his clothing in front of everyone else. Uh, carefully wraps Jesus up with these spices that he's bought and prepared and carries Jesus' body to the tomb and lays it there. I think we see this transition in Nicodemus from a uh, kind of passive observer with a curiosity to someone who's willing to uh, perhaps try and engage with Jesus and defend Jesus to someone who says, absolutely, I, I want to be associated with him no matter what it costs me. I believe that the resurrection changes everything, that it can change our grief and it can change our fear and it can change our doubt and it can also change our indifference as God breaks our heart for the things that breaks his as well. Church, at some point, as we trust in Jesus, at some point, that will involve an action that maybe seems uncomfortable to us as we get our hands dirty in the real work of reaching out, of serving others, of loving our neighbors. At some point, we need to reconcile the facts that either Jesus was a fraud or he really is the Son of God who lived and died and rose again. And that he also sends us out with the greatest news the world has ever heard. 
I want you to leave here today knowing that eternal life is yours and forgiveness is yours and the message is yours. All in Jesus. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we've walked through these um, pages of Scripture, as we've talked about indifference, God, I pray that we feel convicted in that. I pray that we would recognize the incredible wealth that we are in this room, some of the very richest, wealthiest people in the world, that we're the top percentage of wealthy people on planet Earth, and that you've blessed us to be a blessing. God, I pray that you'd help us, to, that you'd just compel us to spend more time with you, not just reading, but coming to understand who you were, Jesus, and the things that drove you, the things that motivated you, the things that uh, made you weep and made you celebrate. Now, we'd, we'd start to shape our lives around those things, too, that we'd find the rhythms that you followed and embrace them as our own. And God, I also pray that you would convict us of that one thing that breaks our hearts. And, and if there's nothing, God, that that would be convicting to us as well, and that we would pick something and invest in it, that we'd immerse ourselves in something that breaks your heart that we'd allow it to break us as well and that we would use the time and energy, the days we've been given and the riches that we have to make a difference for our neighbors, whether we have ever met them or whether they're halfway across the world. God, I pray for each person here that they would absolutely know beyond the shadow of a doubt that they are loved by you, that you lived and died and rose again for them, for their forgiveness, and so that they could have eternal life with you forever. Pray that they'd leave here knowing that the kingdom is theirs and that at the same time the message is theirs. I pray that we would receive that also as an incredible blessing and an opportunity to go and share, that we have something to offer the world and that it's you. God, I pray for all the other things going on in our hearts and minds. We pray for those who are struggling in any way, whether that's physical or emotional, spiritual, mental, whatever that might be, relational. We ask that you'd be with them, that you'd bring them comfort and healing and hope. God, we pray for um, and give you thanks for all those people who have been traveling from this service and are home again for the renters and the buckleses. We ask that you'd be with anyone else who's traveling for Miranda for bringing her home safely. We ask that you'd be with uh, Principal Beamers as he travels, that you'd bring him back safely. We pray for the ministry of this school and ask that it would uh, just continue to thrive and that it would uh, um, just be filled to overflowing and that we'd see great blessing and transformation in children's and families' lives through that. God, for everything else in our hearts and minds, um, for the people in Yemen, for the people around the world who go without food on a regular basis, we pray that you'd provide it for them and that you'd use us to be part of that solution. For places where there's conflict, where people live in fear for their lives on a daily basis, we pray that you'd bring peace. Where there's divisions, whether they're on a global scale or just in a family, we ask that you'd bring healing and reconciliation. For everything else, we commit these things to you, trusting in Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.